Hello, everyone. Varghutika Khalsa, Varghutika Fateh. In this paper, I will attempt to locate markers of gender, sexuality, and desire for Sikh American girls. I will also analyze a blog entitled Muslim.net and a Christian girls blog entitled We Used to Be You.net. This is an initial investigation, and for the purposes of this paper, I am unable to delve further into religious nuances and boundaries within those very labels that I understand are very complex. I use blogs as an archival source to make observations and analyses of how the performance of respectability becomes the primary mode of engagement in Sikh American female lives, and in comparison, Muslim American women as well. I posit that sexuality and desire is firmly constituted under the banner of respectability. In comparison, white Christian women and girls seem to be more interested in how to rein in sexual behavior. I will describe how, in racialized religious communities, portions of these blogs manifest ideas of modesty, piousness, and respectability. And these blogs themselves become a site for the performance of respectability. Um, well, first I want to tell you, my family did come over in 1984. Uh, my father wears a turban, my brother wears a parka, he did. And he was teased and harassed so much that my mother cut his hair when he was um, six years old. And my family's really gone through a lot of trauma for that. And I've really made it my entire life's mission to make sure that the Sikh voice is heard, especially those of females and young girls. Um, my research is on girls 12 to 18. So I just want to sort of tell you a little bit about that before I begin. Um, I'm interested in gender identity to locate how desire and sexuality manifest themselves for Sikh girls in the US and compare them to Muslim and, Sikh, uh, Muslim and Christian girls. To date, there are no existing academic texts that locate these very ideas, and I will look at archival material to do so. I will integrate Yen Lee Espiritu's We Don't Sleep Around Like White Girls Do, Family, Culture, and Gender in Filipina American Lives, Nancy Chaudhro's Family Structure and Feminine Personality, Laila Abu Lagod's Do Women Muslim Really Need Saving, um, anthropological desires and cultural relativism, and Deborah Tolman's desires, uh, dilemmas of desire to deconstruct how ethnocentrism and religious nationalism are intertwined to produce various ideological strains of femininity, sexuality, and desire in girls' lives. <clears throat> I will also look at three blogs, um, Bitch Magazine, MuslimGirl.net, and Karista Fresh and Fearless, um, and we used to be you, Christian blog, um, to look at as comparative research tools. Um, for the most part, I will also look at um, the girls' blogs as an archival source and um, the authoritative tone that the commentary has taken on leads me to believe that the responding columnists are adults, but I am still researching that part. In a 1974 article entitled Family Structure and Feminine Personality, Nancy Chaudhro writes, in any given society, feminine personality comes to define itself in relation and connection to other people more than masculine personality does. In psychoanalytical terms, women are less individuated than men. They have more flexible ego boundaries. As so-called individuals with less individuated boundaries, young women are susceptible to being molded. Chaudhuro argues that women's motherhood and mothering roles seem to be the most important feature in accounting for universal secondary status of women. I am not integrating Chaudhuro's claim about motherhood because I necessarily agree. Rather, I'm interested in analyzing what political and hierarchical uh, role motherhood plays for sick women. Is motherhood a power position that then infers normality and morality? thus allowing them to have a voice within Sikh nationalist movements? Do Sikh women clearly verbalize that Sikh girls should take a second class role to Sikh men, or is this message instilled in our learned behaviors? How does Chaudhuro's theory apply to a religious, ethnic, racialized population of Sikh American girls? In order to the question, I first go to Yen Lee Espiritu's in We Don't Sleep Around Like White Girls Do. 
um, in, it, in which the author conducts a study of 100 Filipina American girls of various socioeconomic background in San Diego. Her findings show that while white came to be associated with the norm for the Filipino American community, white American is still portrayed as deviant in moral standards. Espiritu writes, the construction of white Americans as the other and American culture as deviant serves a dual purpose. It allows immigrant culture to reinforce patriarchy through the sanctioning of women's forced misbehavior and to present an unblemished, if not morally superior, public face to dominant society. In other words, the immigrant community uses restrictions on women's lives and as one force of resistance to racism. Espiritu asserts that the figure of the Filipina becomes embedded in codes of morality within the Filipino community and is then posited against white U.S. racism. These particular tropes of proper moral womanhood for Filipina women in comparison to whites reverberates in strands of Chadro's argument of femininity as motherhood. Deborah Tolman in Dis Dilemmas of Desire asks teenage girls questions such as, how do you locate desire? What does desire mean to you? How do you express desire? Muslim.net and Carista websites both have advice sections for young women on how to communicate with young men. These sections are called Guys and Friendships. Um, for Muslim.net, he won't put a label on it under the subheading of Ask Carista. Notions of what is considered respectable, how to set appropriate boundaries, and how to communicate these ideas are listed in the advice section, particularly in the Muslim.net site when a woman asks how to deal with interactions with young men in public, the response from the advice columnist is, Omar asks you if you would like to go to the library for a study session. There are many ways to go with this. Depending on your comfort level, you can agree to go with Omar. How, however, you must ensure that this is a public space with many others around. As always, there is another route you can take. Agree to Omar's request and subtly invite another friend who happens to also be in chemistry class. Sure, sounds great. I'll ask Fatima if she's up for it as well. You never know. Maybe it will turn into a big study group instead of just you two. This way, you have not offended Omar and get a chance to improve your grade. In comparing the above, where the advice to the girl is to not be alone with the boy, carista.net, where the advice is regarding dated ver dating versus hooking up, quote unquote, the website says the following. Truth is, right now he only sees you as a hookup buddy. You are giving him everything he wants without the commitment. So why should you bother putting a label on it? He probably has a rotation of girls for all you know. You know what you want. You want a strong, committed relationship in marriage. You want a strong, committed relationship that will lead to marriage. Interestingly, these forms of communication and types of advice given are constructions of what is proper and interpreted in various veins. I argue that desires constructed through marriageability and young women are told what the goals of sexual expression must be. In reading a Christian Girls Young Women's Advice page entitled, We Used to Be You, a male columnist writes in reference to what sexual purity means, no man wants a cigarette smoking, deer deer beer drinking, club hopper as a wife. What type of woman is that? She's not trustworthy. That's why, that's why many guys treat women disrespectfully. Here, the male advises against exploring sexuality and desire and um, even goes as far as to justify violence against the woman due to this behavior. The dominant message that young women repeatedly receive is that respectability is solely based on how you communicate, what messages you give to men, and what boundaries you set up. The message appears to be that marriage is the final goal. These notions of respectability do not include desire, sexual pleasure, pleasuring oneself, is the concept of expressing desire considered a white liberal framework? Do Sikh and Muslim women find ways to subvert authori at the authoritar authoritative messages of abstinence? I've set up a binaristic interpretation. How can I locate desire and manifestations of sexuality of Sikh and Muslim girls? I locate sexuality and desire in the very angst and anxiety-ridden spaces from which the young women are asking questions. Also, the altering of hijabs and changing hairstyles could be considered deviant in a more orthodox analysis of proper behavior. The advice from colonists may be considered conservative, but young women are nonetheless asking questions, even if the tone and modality leads to discomfort. The space that is opening up for young women 
is um, about asking questions itself is the form of resistance. This also asks me to then um, ask the question, this leads me to ask the question, if advice columnists set up the dichotomy of respectability with abstinence, then does losing respectability mean that a woman engages in sex? All three websites enforce and advise marriage as the end goal of a heteronormative relationship, where sexual desire and free expression are discouraged. Um, how much longer do I have? Okay. So I'm going to just actually skip through the self-care questions and just go to the end. Oh, let's see here. Um, okay. In my analysis, I assert that finding agency is, um, I don't, um, I don't actually argue what agency is. I'm trying to locate modes of resistance within the actual forms of um, what is considered resistant behavior. Um, these messages of becoming, of remaining pure, chaste, and respectable are clearly um, against the messages that we have, we are receiving as young Sikh women in popular culture. I will close with the discussion of the analysis of Bitch Magazine, a counterpart um, that is released quarterly. Bitch Magazine's mission is to provide and encourage and engage thoughtful feminist response to media, uh, mainstream media and popular culture. Bitch Magazine blog, similarly to Corista and MuslimGirl.net, has several sections including history, humor, mad world, movie, sex, sexuality, social commentary. Sports. Bitch proclaims that they do not claim one monolithic type of feminism in comparison to claims of modesty and respectability and ways to demonstrate these through one's demeanor, clothing, hair, and familial relationships. Bitch Magazine's entire section on sexuality is labeled Think Kink, The Final Leather Clad, Playing with Race in BDSM, Some Like It Rough, and The Politics of BDSM Fashion. These messages about sexuality suggest empowerment, resistance, ownership of one's body analysis, uh, body analysis, and reclaiming various forms of power play. They are considered white liberal feminist claims that resist mainstream forms of submissive sexuality for women and girls. How can we interpret these codes of sexual empowerment against messages that are given in Karista and Muslim.net. I return to the young women from Karista as a primary site of analysis. The young women that partake in blog culture are finding community um, and navigating the realities of being racialized and gendered, ethnicized subjectivities in the United States. I am not claiming that concrete forms of agency manifest in one way or another. Rather, I am arguing that young women and in Sikh and Muslim American communities are navigating against white heteronormative constructions of desire and sexuality by reinterpreting how they can resist while simultaneously attempting to be in respectable positions in their ethnic, religious, and racialized communities. Thank you.